Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Marissa Waterman. I'm the Marketing Director here at the Academy. Here with us today, we have a few folks from Stanley Consultants to discuss compliance regarding the new EPA multi-sector general industrial stormwater permit. Also joining us today is our Executive Director, Dr. Daniel Other. Dr. Other will serve as the moderator today. During the presentation, you'll be able to submit a question by clicking on the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen. Before we get started, Dr. Other would like to say a few words. Dr. Other, how are you? I'm well, thanks, Marissa. Welcome to everyone. I'm really glad to be here with Tyler and Bill and Trent. Today, we have an exciting webinar for the Academy. I'd like to start by specifically thanking the patrons of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. The financial support of the patrons is essential to the successful operation of the Academy, and we're grateful for their support. I'd also like to give a special thanks to today's webinar sponsor, Stanley Consultants. Thank you, Stanley Consultants, for sponsoring today's webinar. Today, we'll be hearing about complying with new EPA multi-sector general industrial stormwater permits. We'll be looking at a range of cost alternatives. Before I introduce our speaker and hand over the floor to them for their presentation, I'd like to remind colleagues that our webinars are meant to be interactive. Throughout the webinar, please post your questions in the QA bar. I'll be reading these in real time. I'll be combining them together. And then at the end of the webinar, I'll come back and moderate a discussion of the presentation. This will allow a chance for our speakers to answer your question in a format where I've pulled together the various questions that'll appear. So do please put your questions throughout the entire webinar. Don't just hold them to the end. And now I'd like to begin. First, let me introduce Tyler Marshall. Tyler is a principal environmental engineer in the Iowa City office of Stanley Consultants. He performs civil and environmental engineering projects for major industry since 1998. I'd next like to introduce Bill Kerrig. Bill is an environmental consultant in the Iowa City office of Stanley Consultants. And finally, let me introduce Trent Humphrey. Trent is an environmental engineer in training for Stanley Consultants. Gentlemen, the stage is yours, and we're looking forward to learning more about complying with the EPA multi-sector general industrial stormwater permits, a range of cost alternatives. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for the opportunity to present today. We appreciate it very much. <clears throat> so just briefly, uh, what our presentation today is going to cover, uh, I'll, we've already kind of got some of the introductions out of the way, but uh, we'll run through some of the big picture discussion of why we care about stormwater, why it matters, um, and then what is the multi-sector general permit? Some of the folks in the audience may already know what this is, or it may be a completely new thing. So we'll ease into some of the background in terms of what, what it is and how, <clears throat> how it's relevant to, uh, to, to facilities and, and dischargers. Then in addition to that, uh, we'll dig a little bit deeper into what facilities can do to prepare to some of the changes in the regulatory environment and what sort of improvements you might be able to make to meet the, the benchmarks, which you, you may have uh, either already or coming soon. As Daniel mentioned, uh, it's going to be a, a team of three of us giving the presentation to get today, and uh, we have uh, we are part of the Stanley Consultants stormwater compliance team. We have worked with dozens of different facilities all over the United States and around the world. Uh, and so I feel like uh, we, we've got a, a pretty good perspective on the kinds of issues that dischargers are, are facing uh, both today and, and coming up in the future. So some of this content may look a little familiar to you. Uh, we did previously publish a series of articles in Industrial Water and Waste Digest on this, and I would encourage you to, uh, to look those up if you want to go back and, and revisit some of the, the material that we talked about or maybe get a little bit more in depth on some of the nuts and bolts. So uh, please uh, go, go check that out. So big picture. Um, why, why do we care about stormwater? And I mean, that seems like kind of an obvious question, but you know, precipitation, rainfall, the water runs off and it just kind of goes away. A lot of people, it disappears from, from your mind pretty quickly. 
but stormwater, it really is one of the, the big drivers, one of the mechanisms for, for causing problems on, on a global scale. Uh, there's a lot of different things that, uh, that, that are spurred or driven through stormwater inputs. Uh, you, you hear about things like algae blooms, dead zones, uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, microplastics, and, and also uh, emerging pollutants like uh, PFAS and PFOA. Um, and then even just recently with the train derail derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, one of the big concerns is what's going to happen to all of those chemicals and the residuals from the fire when uh, you know spring rainfall hits that. Is it going to carry it downstream? How is that going to impact the ecosystem? How is that going to impact people uh, you know, even you know, dozens or hundreds of miles away? So I'm just going to touch on a few of these um, up front here. So algae blooms. Um, algae is one of those things that algae is, is an important part of our ecosystem. Um, you know, it's part of the food chain, but as with a lot of things in life, too much can be a bad thing. Uh, you get a lot of input of nutrients from stormwater and it can lead to algae blooms which in many cases, the actual algae itself can be harmful or toxic. There's different varieties of algae which can uh, directly release uh, cyanotoxins into the water. And so algae blooms that of the wrong variety can lead to shutting down of municipal water supplies. Uh, it can lead to the, the shut, shutting down of recreational facilities. I mean, it's very common to see uh, public beaches or lakes uh, have the restriction, rest, uh, restrictions on recreation and boating uh, because of the potential for the presence of those toxins. And the, the toxins actually can be especially harmful to, to pets. So if you're at a stream or at a pond where there's a, a, an algae bloom of the, uh, the type that gives off those cyanotoxins, it's very deadly especially for dogs. Um, and so in addition to being directly toxic, when the algae uh, population explodes and consumes the nutrients that are available in the water, uh, it, it's, it's just a matter of time before that, that, that explosion of algae dies off. And so the decay of all of that organic matter can consume the oxygen from the, the water column or the waterway that, that it's in. And so you see, again, every year you see a lot of cases where you have massive fish kills, such as the, the, the picture from uh, uh, Texas uh, that's up on the, the, the screen. And so that, that is especially aggravated in areas where you have shallow or, or warm waters. But it's, um, again, it's a very common occurrence, especially in those areas where you have a lot of agricultural runoff input and, and stagnant water. Now, in addition to localized fish kills, and you know, I, I said uh, how, how the dissolved oxygen gets reduced through the decay of that organic matter. Well, the Mississippi River is carrying a huge amount of nutrients downstream from, from its watershed. And so this is something that a lot of people have maybe heard about. Um, it's kind of dropped off the news lately, but uh, there are, there's an area in the Gulf of Mexico, um, as the water kind of circulates in that counterclockwise direction, where the dissolved oxygen is so low that it's having huge impacts on aquatic life and, and also the communities that depend on the Gulf of Mexico for shrimping or, or fishing. Um, and even though it's kind of dropped off the news a little bit, it's still there. It's thousands of square miles in size. And it's something that it's going to require a lot of work from, from all of us in upstream watersheds to, to help address. And, and, and so that uh, increasing awareness of stormwater and um, how it can be a mechanism for those, those types of changes you know, that it is very important on that global level, but it's also something that is right on the forefront of people's minds at the community level. Um, it's something that, that stormwater, you know, is, is gonna be heavily impacted through climate change. 
Uh, I've seen projections from different uh, uh, presentations, you know, scientists and things that you just just here in the in the upper, upper Midwest that uh, peak storm intensities could increase by 25 or 30 percent um, within my lifetime. And so, if you're designing your infrastructure uh, 30 years from now, you may be significantly undersizing things. And so you combine that with things like aging infrastructure and storm sewers and, and, and um, you know, conveyances and the increasing pressure that we're putting on our watersheds through more and more urbanization, um, it's, it's a major problem. And it's something that it's already a major issue with, with flash flooding and things like that, but it's going to get worse. Um, and so our governmental agencies at, you know, from the federal level all the way down to the local level, they're definitely aware of that. And so uh, you are seeing increasing regulation to help kind of push communities to, to be, be ready, to be prepared for those, those future conditions. So I mentioned that stormwater can be a source of pollution. Uh, there's an interesting uh, data set available from Minnesota Pollution Control Agency where they did urban stormwater runoff sampling in, in a few different locations. And just, I picked a few of these out just to indicate, just to illustrate, you know, things like cadmium, copper, lead, zinc, um, that they're seeing concentrations of all these pollutants that are near or potentially over a, a, a water quality standard. So, and typically that's looking at like the aquatic life standard. So what that means is that the levels of toxics that are going into these waterways are potentially damaging, if not fatal to um, the, uh, the, the, the macro invertebrates and the small fish, especially um, that, that may be present. <clears throat> and then the algae, uh, so nutrients, now this is, this is urban runoff, uh, so you're seeing a fair amount of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and suspended solids, but uh, also agricultural runoff is a major source. Uh, statistics that I've seen indicates that ag runoff could be anywhere 70 to 80 percent of the, the nutrient loading in the Mississippi River Basin, just as an example. So. Uh, the point is, is that I think that there's room for improvement for all of us. And so the, I think that, that in general, people are becoming more and more aware of the impacts of stormwater runoff. And so you're seeing more awareness and more action happening at that local level. It's not just something that the state needs to put out a new regulation. It's something that individual communities, individual industries are, are taking steps both through choice and through compliance uh, to, to improve the quality of their stormwater runoff. <clears throat> and one of the things that we've seen recently is that one of the drivers for a lot of these improvements is the, the ESG uh, desires of shareholders. So that's environmental and social and governance concepts. And so a lot of, a lot of um, uh, corporate uh, boardrooms are, are committing to being good environmental stewards and committing to ESG targets. A lot of shareholders are pushing more and more money, investing in those companies that embrace these, these ideas. Uh, and one of the things that you'll see is that taking common sense steps to improve your stormwater quality can satisfy a lot of the objectives of, I mean, there, there's different ESG benchmarks, ESG programs, but stormwater can be kind of a common ingredient. You can reduce the pollutant load. Uh, you can address environmental justice by reducing the impacts of water quality or flash flooding on areas that have maybe aging infrastructure. Um, and you can embrace a lot of governance approaches where you're doing a lot of planning and collaboration, stakeholder involvement to make sure that you're aware of your impacts on your community and you're doing things to, to, uh, to, to help them out. Um, and so, you know, ESG as a, as a driver is definitely more of a voluntary sort of thing that facilities or industries are taking on and a lot of municipalities as well. Uh, but 
there are also a lot of regulatory drivers. There's carrots and there's sticks. And so the, 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 the regulatory side of things, that definitely represents the stick approach. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna turn this over to Bill Kerrig and he can get into some of the, the stickier aspects of the, the regulatory environment. All right, thanks, Tyler. So um, this first slide here, we're just gonna kind of give an overview of the regulatory environment. Um, a lot of us here, you know, we heard about, you know, rivers catching on fire in Ohio, you know, in the, I guess late 60s, early 70s. So the Clean Water Act was implemented um, during the Nixon administration in 1972. And then in the 80s, you know, we have the National Stormwater Permit Program and um, what that kind of gave us the, the origins of, um, you know, what's considered, you know, quote unquote industrial activity, which I'll be talking about here in a minute. And also, um, you know, adopted the concept of, you know, general stormwater permits for, um, you know, facilities that are engaging in industrial activity. And a lot of states, they develop their own stormwater permitting programs but they're kind of based on the multi-sector general permit, which I'll be talking about here um, during this presentation. Then the 90s, we have the phase two rule, which expanded some definitions and coverage and also um, stormwater pollution prevention plan requirements. So multi-sector general permit. What is the multi-sector general permit? Multi-sector general permit, it's a permit issued by the, the US EPA, and it basically regulates facilities that are engaging in industrial activity. Now, industrial activity is defined in um, you know, the, the federal regulations, you know, 40 CFR at the, the reg cited there. And um, it basically, um, facilities that are engaging in industrial activity are required to have permit coverage. So here, so the, the definition of stormwater industrial activity, as I mentioned on the prior slide is, you know, defined in the regulations, but basically if you're um, an industrial facility and you, you know, generate precipitation runoff from material handling and equipment activities, industrial machinery, raw materials, intermediate products, final products, waste products, byproducts. Basically, if, if a raindrop touches something that um, you know, is involved in industrial activity and you're in certain industries based on your standard industry classification code, you're required to have a permit. So the multi-sector general permit, you know, is a part of the title, multi-sector. So there are different sectors have different requirements. So an example that I like to give is like a, a grain processing facility. They're going to have different set of requirements than a facility that does aluminum forming. Now, a lot of the requirements are going to be the same for no matter what your industrial operation is. However, there's... Um, specific um, benchmarks, which I'll be talking about later, which are pollutant concentration. I don't want to use the word limits, but um, they're benchmarks, they're values that the EPA would like you to meet. We'll be talking about those and there's other requirements um, for specific um, sectors. And then um, there, there could, a particular facility, you may hit two different requirements. There might be two different sectors with those requirements that are applicable to your facility. Another example I'd like to give there is if you're a grain processing facility and you also have like a power cogeneration facility at your plant, um, the outfalls, the, the stormwater that comes in contact with the grain processing part of it will have different requirements at their outfalls than the stormwater that goes through the outfalls tied to the cogeneration facility. And um, there's also the sectors, you know, there's, there's specific benchmarks and there's also other requirements related to pollution prevention, um, record keeping, you know, and other stuff related that, that vary from sector to sector. So what, what brought us to this, um, what brought us to this point? 
um, for the to talk about the 2021 multi-sector general permit and why are we concerned with it. So I'll give a little bit of some recent history there. Um, the multi-sector general permit, um, the most recent one up until recently was the 2015 version. Now that the 2015 version did not have a lot of teeth behind it. It wasn't very robust with um, respect to enforcement. And because of that, a lot of environmental groups challenged the 2015 multi-sector general permit um, because they wanted to see more results. They wanted um, you know, stormwater to be a little bit more regulated. So what happened then is in 2016, there was a settlement agreement um, for the EPA to make a stronger, for lack of a better term, multi-sector general permit with more monitoring requirements, more um, enforcement mechanisms. So um, in 2020, they released a draft, per a draft version of the multi-sector general permit. And based on public response, you know, specifically from industry, the, the final permit that they came out with in 2021 was a little bit less restrictive than the 2020 draft permit, which, you know, kind of put the proverbial hammer down. So but even though the final permit that was issued in 2021 didn't have as much, um, I'll, I'll use the, the term again, teeth to it than the 2020 draft permit, one thing we're definitely seeing is the permits are going towards the direction of more and more regulation, more and more enforcement. So what's the big deal? Um, a lot of, you know, like I brought up before in the 2015 multi-sector general permit, um, enforcement has mostly been kind of toothless. They basically just have, they, they may have narrative standards for example, um, stormwater should be free of debris and sheen, um, or they'll have benchmark values, which again are um, different pollutant concentrations that you're expected to hit, but no mechanism related to enforcement and essentially just um, having you do additional evaluation to try harder to meet those limits. So now the one thing I, I want to bring up is that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the multi-sector general permit is the backbone that's used for the different states to put together their general stormwater permits for you know, discharges associated with industrial activity. So, and they could vary kind of dramatically from state to state. Some states have already had um, benchmark values where there's sampling requirements and if you're below if you're above a certain level it can trigger enforcement some states don't have sampling requirements um, at all so one thing with the 2021 you know, multi-sector general permit it's going to be adding additional implementation measures so if you exceed your benchmark concentrations you're going to have to do more than maybe you've been doing historically so Technical requirements in the new multi-sector general permit. Um, there's more sampling requirements now. Um, and so most sectors will have to sample for like um, you know, pH, total suspended solids and chemical oxygen demand. And then many facilities, depending on what sector you fall into, there will be additional monitoring requirements for additional parameters and that will have benchmark values tied to it, which I'll be talking about shortly. And then, so for the new multi-sector general permit, if you, if you do your monitoring in the first year of coverage and you do not exceed your benchmark targets, then you, know, you don't have to sample again until the fourth year of coverage. And typically state stormwater permits are issued for five years and the multi-sector general permits typically is, you know, modified and reissued every five years as well. So 
Another requirement is that there might be more monitoring if a facility discharges to a waterway that's already impaired for a particular pollutant, or if you don't meet benchmark values, then there would certainly be additional monitoring requirements. And then we'll be talking about the um, additional implementation measures and there's tiered corrective actions associated with those. Excuse me, just had to go on mute there to cough for a second. There's some administrative requirements as well with the new multi-sector general permit. Historically, you have not been required to submit your stormwater pollution prevention plan along with your notice of intent. Your notice of intent is essentially your application for coverage under the permit. There's also public notification, corrective actions. If, um, if you exceed your benchmarks, it may get out into the public, basically what that means. And then there's like signage requirements and, um, you know, stormwater pollution plan requirements as well that are in the new multi-sector general permit, a little bit more stringent. So this map here shows um, which states does the multi-sector general permit apply. I mentioned before that most states have authorization from the EPA to issue their own general stormwater permits. So for states where they do not have that authorization, then the, the EPA's multi-sector general permit just applies as is in those states. And then the other states, their permits um, will vary. And we'll be talking about that in a little bit here. So most states already have some sort of benchmarks. And I, I could give a, a couple examples. Like um, <clears throat> we work with a client that has facilities in a lot of Midwest states. And we've seen in um, a couple of these states where they have benchmark monitoring requirements where they're supposed to be below certain levels. However, if they exceed the benchmarks, they're just required to send in a letter within 60 days saying what they're doing about it. And um, they basically just copy and paste the same letter every quarter saying, we're going to increase housekeeping. And that's been getting them by. You know, they, they haven't had any enforcement on that. And this is an example of the kind of stuff that they may not be able to get away with much longer once the provisions of the new multi-sector general permit hit their state. Um, some states, they have benchmarks already that only apply to certain sectors, certain industries, not all of them that are in the multi-sector general permit. And, you know, some don't have any monitoring requirements at all. Again, there's a lot of um, individual variation. And we'll be talking about the timeline for the states to start implementing the new multi-sector general permit into their state permits. So the additional implementation measures, what are these? This is something that um, is kind of an important part to this presentation because there's a, a three-tiered approach to compliance monitoring. So I, I mentioned several times, you know, benchmark sampling, where the new multi-sector general permit is gonna require you to collect samples. And you know, if your numbers are below benchmarks, you're good. You only have to do the sampling after year one and year four. However, if you exceed the benchmarks, um, you're gonna have to do something about it. I really like this slide here. This is, um, I think this came from the EPA presentation. It, it basically gives a, it, it shows you what happens as you get through the different um, implementation, through the different levels. So what I'm gonna, all facilities, you start at baseline status. That basically means you have not exceeded a benchmark standard. You are in, you're in compliance, you're in good standings. That's where everyone wants to be. So when you do your um, benchmark monitoring, if you exceed a benchmark value, um, then you, know, the, you can see the triggers there. You could go into level one. Level one isn't that bad. It's not very painful. 
Um, you review your stormwater pollution prevention plan, evaluate your best management practices and your stormwater control measures. Um, the intent there is like make a few minor tweaks to get you back to baseline and then all is good again. If you're already in level one and you continue to have exceedances, you get into level two. Level two is a little bit more stringent, you know, where you need to um, implement some additional pollution prevention measures, like um, actually add some more requirements to your stormwater pollution prevention plan, add some more standard operating procedures, um, you know, whatever, and, you know, kind of continue the monitoring there. And if the measures you did in level two, bring your numbers back down to below benchmarks, then you're back at baseline again, which is where everyone wants to be. Now, if you're in level two and your numbers continue to be high, you're gonna go into the dreaded level three. Now, um, most industrial facilities, you want to stay out of level three because that's where you have to start spending some real money. I could give an example of, um, you know, we're working with a facility and in their state has not adopted these um, additional implementation measures yet. They have not um, taken the, these provisions from the multi-sector general permit to put in their state um, general permit yet. But we're, they, they know it's coming. So we're looking at the numbers. So right, in, if they were to suddenly have to deal with these, um, implementation measures right now, it wouldn't be too long before they get into level three. And then, um, you know, we may be talking like what to design and install a new pond, potentially. Do they have enough real estate for the pond? You know, because they do need to be engineered and sized correctly. They're right along a river. You know, there, there's some floodplain concern. So it may be a challenge to install some kind of permanent control there. So we're, we're, we're evaluating now um to what we can do over the next couple years to try and get out of that level three because eventually they're gonna have to do something about it well, like i mentioned before you can't just continue to send in a letter every quarter saying we'll improve housekeeping um but still even if you're in level three let's say that that example i gave in level three let's say they do install a permanent control and their numbers go down they could go back to baseline status and be in compliance <laughs> Excuse me. There are some exceptions to this. For example, if your particular parameter is a natural background sources or if the run on sources, like if it's stormwater runoff that's coming onto your site from another site, there's ways you could kind of get out of it. If it's a one time abnormal event, you may be able to convince the regulator that um, you could stay in baseline status. Another exception is if the discharge does not result in exceedance of a water quality standard. And where that may come into play is, let's say if you discharge to a small stream and that small stream is not very long and then that, that, that small stream goes to a large river, let's say the Mississippi River, you may be held to um, end of pipe water quality standards, as opposed to being able to get um, some dilution credits you know, mixing zone from a larger stream. So that is another potential way to, you know, kind of work with the regulators to try and get something accomplished here. And there's other, um, okay, we'll move on to the, this is an example of a benchmark. So this is like, subsector U1 and U2. And I, I brought them up as an example a few times for grain mill products. So if you have um, standard industry classifications, you know, if you see these numbers here, you know, 2041 and 2079. If your facility falls into the subsector, here's an example of what you would expect for what parameters you would need to monitor for and what the benchmark monitoring concentration would be. So now for grain mill products, what we've seen is that these numbers are very challenging to meet. Um, I think when Tyler was showing a slide earlier, it was just showing, showing general urban runoff of having total suspended solids of over 100 milligrams per liter. 
if you're dealing with grains, um, you know, grain mill, um, it you could have the best of intentions with housekeeping. It still may be a challenge to get under that 100 milligrams per liter, which could get you up into that aim level three pretty quickly, which is what you want to avoid. Another one I want to point out here that's kind of low related to nutrients is the nitrate plus nitrite nitrogen, 0 0.68 milligrams per liter. We've also seen that that could be a challenge as well. And um, you know, the, the, the other parameters too, when you look at the BOD and COD, those numbers aren't always easy to meet. So there, a lot of facilities are going to have a lot of challenges with these benchmarks. This is another example benchmark, um, and I, I think this is brought up because it's a relatively common one, fabricated metal products. Um, there's a lot of facilities that would fall into that <clears throat> sector. And if you see here, we have some metals. Um, you know, we have total recoverable aluminum and zinc. And as you can see, it's like hardness dependent based on the receiving water. And then these also have that um, nitrate plus nitrite nitrogen level of 0 0.68, which again is a challenge to meet. So the, all the different sectors have, you know, you could have widely different parameters and benchmarks. As you can see in these two examples, this is very different from what you see for the, the grain, grain milling. So what should you do to prepare? Um, even if your state has their own um, general stormwater permit and they have not yet adopted um, these additional implementation measures from the 2021 multi-sector general permit, it's advised to take a look at the permit to see what kind of requirements will be coming at you in the near future. Uh, figure out what sector you belong in and the requirements associated with it. And, you know, I brought up that example before, start working towards compliance now. Yeah, I brought up an example of that site that is con continuously above the benchmarks, which aren't really enforceable yet. But, um, you know, if we maybe we could figure something out before they do get implemented into their state permit so we could stay out of level three once it matters. And how much time do facilities have to prepare? Um, the quick answer to that is it varies. I brought up that slide earlier that shows many, well, not many, but some states do not have the authorization from the EPA to issue their own state general permits. So the multi-sector general permit applies there. And that was as of May, 2021, they're, they're already there. Other states are at various, it, it, it depends on the, the states with their five-year um, general permit cycles. One thing that we have seen some states have issued drafts of their next general stormwater permit, and we're seeing these benchmark sampling requirements, and we're starting to see, um, we're also starting to see some of these additional implementation measure requirements. And, you know, Again, they're, they're five-year permits, so some of these permits, you might not see these in there for another three, four, five years. Some of them, they might be coming a lot quicker. And even if you're like three, four, five years away from these benchmark monitoring requirements becoming part of your permit, um, again, it may seem like a while, but time flies. So starting early you know, could definitely absorb some capital expenditure, you know, I'm sorry, make it easier to absorb some capital expenditures. There's that term, you know, an ounce of, ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So um, go to the dentist every six months to avoid the big root canal in a few years. And that's kind of what we're saying here. And then now um, Trenton Humphrey, he's going to talk you through what are some of the things we can do to keep the numbers low to stay out of that um, level three. Perfect. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. Um, so we're going to start with the first steps here. Um, first off, I would recommend 
looking up your SIC code, as, as Bill is just talking about, um, see what your parameters are and how you're going to start comparing to those. Um, if you have any um, previous analytical data from your sampling, um, take a look at that, see where you lie within the range. Um, if you're good, if you're in compliance, you know, good work, uh, keep it up. You can always work on housekeeping. It's a good thing. Um, and then if you're not in compliance, well, then we want to start looking for that source, um, see if we can find the, the pollution. So first we want to begin with a source identification. Um, you know, how many outfalls do you have at your facility? Um, are they easily accessible? Can you get down to them? Um, can that operator or lab technician be able to walk down, easily sample them? Um, is your outfall, you know, sedimented in? Um, do they need cleaned out? When they go down to reach to pull a grab sample or they're taking their composite samples, um, are they mixing it up? Or are they getting a lot of, you know, dirt and sediments and et cetera into the sample, which really then, you know, isn't a true sample. Um, another big thing we want to talk about was the commingling of stormwater. Um, Bill mentioned this earlier. So say you have a facility up the road from your facility, um, could be like a grain manufacturer or um, metal uh, fabrication. But when the stormwater, you know, rains, everything washes off their site. Say it goes down a hill under a road through a culvert. Well, then that culvert comes out onto your property. So then at that point, you're going to have every, you know, pollutant or parameter that they have is now going into your stormwater. And this is where Bill is talking about those um, exclusions or exceptions. Um, if we can prove that what's coming onto your property isn't really your pollution source. Um, and then we want to make sure you're sampling the right um, storm event, rain events. Um, you want to make sure you have a 72 hour dry time between rain events. Um, that allows anything in the air or anything that's on your site to, you know, evenly collect. Say you get two storm events, you know, 12 hours apart. Well, anything that would collect in there might not be there because of that reason. So you do want to try to get that dry time. Um, and then overall accessibility to your outfall. Um, I've done a lot of sampling in my time here with Stanley. Um, I've walked down on the catwalks and decks and walked down rocked, you know, banks to get to an outfall. Um, just you want to make sure it's safe um, and, and just really accessible to that person because they don't want to have to try to walk down with two jugs of water and slip and um, then you have a different thing to follow up with. Um, so here we're talking about targeted sampling. Um, so you know where your outfall's at, and now you want to start working from your outfall upstream. Um, this is going to help you figure out um, your internal sampling points. And then from here, you can collect that manholes. Um, if you have like swales on site, if you have a stormwater ditch, um, a really good illustration here on the right is uh, we are at a facility, um, the levels of a certain parameter were kind of high, so we started walking back up their stormwater system. As you can see, it's kind of a milky, muddy um, source coming from the top side of the photo. But then if you look to the right, there's that dark gray. You can definitely tell there's like some sort of material in there that shouldn't be in there. So this would be a good sampling point, you know, give you a baseline data. And then you want to start branching off and figuring out you know, is the source coming from a storage building, a stockpile? Um, is a forklift driver driving from one building to the next building? And, you know, the super sacks bouncing around, dropping stuff. Um, like these are things you want to start looking for. And then you can set up your samplers at those different internal points and then get a lot of data that way. Um, roof vents and stacks, big thing when, uh, you know, exhaust is going out, is anything falling out? Is it settling in your stormwater ditch or is it, you know, going a little farther so that internal sampling can help you find those locations too. Um, and then some biological sources we were discussing. Um, you have your mice, rats, pigeons, geese, and everything, you know, coming onto a facility. Well, when they have their droppings, you know, those collect or when something dies, um, th that'll break down, get in your water, and then you can have, you know, bacteria, coliform, um, a lot of things that you don't really want in your storm water. And then I thought this would be a good time to just discuss, you know, the kind of the basics of a grab sample, composite samples. Um, a technical grab sample is what you collect within the first 30 minutes of discharge. 
Um, this is really important because you got to think about the time of concentration that, you know, it starts raining at 11 o'clock. Well, by the time it gets to the outfall, you know, we hope that's within the first 30 minutes. Um, but also, as soon as it starts discharging, though, that, that's when you got to have that grab sample within 30 minutes. So if you're doing these internal samples, um, make sure you're aware that, you know, to get to your outfall, it takes 20 minutes. So then you have, you know, 30 more minutes to get that first grab. Um, but it might take 10 minutes to get to an in internal point. So at that point, you want to try to get, you know, within 30 minutes. Um, and then your composite samples, what we normally do is collect those every 15 minutes for three hours. Um, and that's called a time-weighted composite. Um, some states, they want flow-weighted composites, which is just going to be What's your intensity of rain event? How much rain did you get over a duration? And then um, we can run a program that tells us, okay, so we need X amount of water from bottle A and then X amount of water from bottle B. And then you, you combine those into a composite and then you can submit those that way. Um, just a couple of photos here of what I've done in the past. Um, we have some grab samples up here on the left and then on the bottom right photo, we have composite samples. As you can tell um, during the grabs, you're pretty much going to get anything that's on the surface is going to run off within that first, you know, quote, 30 minutes, and that'll be collected. And then when you start doing your composite samples, you're going to get a picture in time of what, what's running off site um, during that, say, three hour event. Um, one of them clears up, as you can see, some of the bottles clear up, which is, which is good. Um, but then a couple of them stay pretty dark. So there must be a source that is continuously um, emitting and then that's what we're seeing here and this is a way that we can go okay you know that source is coming from a stockpile under this building that's got a leak and it's slowly washing it out and then the more data is the bet like better so the more storm events you can get you know it'll be a lot better for us to understand what's going on understand your data um, try to figure out you know is this a one-time thing or is it you know pretty common occurrence and then just make sure like i said get that dry time in between it though Um, and, and a really good method that we use, um, we call them auto samplers. Um, there's multiple different kinds out there. So you can purchase, you know, based on your facility's needs. The ones we use here, they're a portable sampler. Um, you connect them to a battery and then you can leave them out in the field. You run tubing into the sampling location. And then how we program them is we say, there's four bottles total in there or there's different configurations on what you need. Um, but we'll say first sample is your grab sample. Um, we'll tell the sampler, we'll figure out the time of concentration. Then we'll say, okay, at you know, 33 minutes, pull the sample. And then after that, we'll make it pull samples every 15 minutes at a certain volume until we get all the volume um, for your composites. And then at that point, the middle photo here is kind of what the jugs look like. Um, you take those out and then you can fill your bottles up, make sure you get everything on ice, you know, you can take your pH, you know, right here, there in the field, um, you know, your pH has a 15 minute hold time. So um, this is a way that you can be on top of it and you're not running around trying to dip a, you know, jug in an outfall and um, this, this just does it all for you. And then a nice thing with, you know, solar panels becoming more popular and, and relevant, uh, we've actually hooked solar panels up now to our units so we can leave them out in the field for months at a time, you know, and we wait for that storm event to come through. Um, we're not, you know, burning gas, driving the truck down and, you know, having to change batteries out. We also have clients who they really like the solar panel and the, the portable sampler because then they can go put it out in the field. Um, we show them how to turn the programs on and they they can just leave it out there. They don't have to oh, you know, where's the nearest light pole or electrical source? They can just put it out there. And um, this is becoming pretty popular with our clients. And the nice thing too with the auto samplers, they've gotten a lot better um, as the times went on. So now you can hook modems up to them. In essence, you can run the sampler off your cell phone. So it'll, it'll text me, it'll say, hey, you know, I got a 10th of an inch of rain. Um, I'm gonna start collecting soon. So then I know, okay, I gotta get up and get to the client site and get that sample done. So, you know, now we've done our internal sampling. We think we found our source. So now we want to look at some ways to reduce the sources. Um, what's generally the quickest, the cheapest? Like, hey, do we have any um, on-site support? Do we have any maintenance that can help us? Um, let's just try to figure out a couple ways that we can knock it down um, relatively easy and fast. 
So the big one that I like to preach is your improved housekeeping. Um, a lot of facilities we go to, you just see, you know, trash, debris, um, you know, like bean holes on the ground. Um, that's something that a facility should be working at, um, get those sweeped up and, and cleaned up. Um, another thing is like when operators are doing daily rounds or um, if you're driving through the plant, um, instead of doing only your monthly SWIP inspection, like have that person or persons, um, you know, looking or saying like, hey, you know, if you see something, let us know so we can get it cleaned up um, right then and there. Um, another big thing is checking your air pollution control devices. Um, say a bag house isn't working right, so you're getting deviations from that. Well, with that, you're also going to get dust or, you know, part, particulate matter is going to, you know, float off in the air. You know, it could go X distance, but then it's going to settle out. You know, does that settle out on a roof or does it settle out in your stormwater ditch? Um, and that could throw your samples off. And then you just want to make sure that um, any loading areas or stockpiles, like a big one is salt storage. You want to, you want to make sure that those are under roof or covered areas. Um, you know, materials like that will easily wash out. Um, and then we, we include a summary sec section here. This is from the EPA, a lot of different BMPs here, um, a lot of good, just general information. I'd highly recommend um, go to this website, look them up, just some different facts, you know, and, and stuff for you to think, think about. So now what happens, like Bill was talking about, you got um, your level three, your level two, level one. Um, so you do your internal sampling, um, you sample your outfalls, you figure out, oh yeah, you know what? I got my SIC code here. I got my, my benchmarks or limits. Um, oh, I'm under them or, hey, I might be in level one. Okay, what can I do? Well, you know, let's look at our housekeeping. Let's do some training. Do we need to update our SWIP plans? Um, you know, let's try to look at those simple items first. And then, you know, if we're, if we're going into the level three, well, we want to start figuring out like, hey, is that stockpile what's causing it? Um, you know, is it something coming off the roof, which our internal sampling should give us some pretty good data about. Um, and that's going to help us to start minimizing those costs at the facility. Um, and then, so the big question, why is stormwater such a challenge to treat? So since the early 2000s, you know, cities have their MS4 permits um, and you struggle because what they found is you have combined sanitary and stormwater systems, which can then inundate that municipality. So what we really wanna try and, and focus on is separating stormwater from your municipal, um, you know, wastewater treatment system. Um, and that, that's kind of what municipalities have been trying to do here lately, is separate those systems out. Um, that can just be pretty costly. Um, and then industrial stormwater, as we know, um, usually has a lot of parameters. It's very specific and designed for that in industrial setting. Um, and then when you have that extra flow of clean stormwater into it, well, then the, the system might not work quite right because it's diluted. Um, there's a lot of solutions that they've developed for, you know, urban areas, um, municipal cities and, you know, bioswales, etc. cetera. Um, but some of those don't really work well with an industrial site. And, and speaking of why they don't work well, is just because you're going to get high volume rain events, um, a precipitation, it can generate, you know, a lot more water um, than you think, you know, if you get a, you know, dry summer day, then all of a sudden you get an inch and a half of rain, like you can fill up a stormwater collection system pretty easy. Um, like we were talking about earlier, if you have that site, you know, say uphill from you um, and it rains up there, all that water is going to flow down the hill. It's still raining at your facility. So then, you know, by the time all of their water gets to you, plus your storm water, um, you could actually just inundate your whole wastewater treatment. Um, and then based on that too, um, if you have too much flow, your traditional physical or chemical treatment plant um, really isn't going to work as it was designed. You know, a wastewater treatment plant really needs, you know, slow velocities, uh, settling time, and then you're, you're not going to get that with that extra storm water flow in. And as I was just talking about, you know, stormwater can be very peaky. Your spring and summer, you're going to get bigger rain events. Um, fall, winter, you're going to get a little bit less of a rain event. But, you know, mainly your spring and summer is, is where you're going to see a lot of these peaks. Um, 
as we're talking about, you know, you can have zero flow to all of a sudden a lot of, you know, rain, you know, in hours, minutes, um, you know, you get a large uh, summer thunderstorm that comes through. Um, it can drop an inch or two of rain is what we've seen um, with Tyler talking about climate change. These uh, peak like storm events are becoming more and more um, common. So then we wanna make sure that your treatment facility is designed to handle that peak rate. Um, some simple fixes here, you know, you put in a bypass basin or you just bypass, you know, parts of the treatment altogether um, to prevent blowouts, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, and then if the incoming velocity into a treatment plant's um, too great, the, the blowouts I was just talking about, um, say it's coming in, um, you can actually blow out any settled contaminants or pollutants, and then that's just going to take it all the way out to your outfall, um, and then you're what you're trying to prevent just, you know, happened. Um, so then you also got to be able to handle um, periods of no flow. Um, you know, wastewater treatment, you typically have your standard flow, but then you're going to have, you know, these peaking flows. So say you have a centrifuge at your print, um, facility because you don't have a lot of size, you can't put a basin in. Um, well, say it dries up in the summer, you don't have any rain for two months. Well, then you're going to start getting, you know, some biological growth in there. Um, the centrifuge itself could just, you know, stop working because, you know, it, it's made for these higher rates and you're not getting them. So as they say, the solution to pollution is a little dilution. Uh, so stormwater, you know, very dilute. Um, your conventional biological treatment is usually ineffective. Um, you have such a large volume of dilute water coming into that. Um, you're not going to get that percent removal is what you're looking for. Um, typical treatment systems won't work right with diluted water. Um, you can have the bugs fail. You can just, um, a lot of things can go wrong because you're not getting um, that efficiency that you thought you were getting at the plant. And so source reduction, um, we want to eliminate as not like as much um, non-industrial um, activity area as we can. Um, if you can eliminate areas with no industrial activity, you know, that water can just get discharged, you know, say straight to a creek. It's not um, associated with industrial activity anymore. So then it's not going to be um, tied with these new tier programs or your SIC codes. Um, if you can repipe an area, regrade an area, um, if you can separate out, um, if you have stormwater combined outfalls, kind of like what the cities are doing, um, separate out as much as you can to, you know, bypass the stuff that has no industrial activity. Um, if you have an area, say, out in a laydown yard where you're storing, just say, sand or salt, for instance, um, but then you have another place closer to the facility that is your actual salt pile, well, just try to combine all of those because then you don't have to now associate that area out there anymore. And then you just reduced a lot of volume. Reducing the volume is going to help your um, existing treatment plants. Um, and I kind of mentioned ponds earlier. Uh, equalization is probably one of your you know, best things. You know, this is what you do at construction sites um, and, and it continuously works. You know, a lot of wastewater treatment plants install a retention basin. So if you have a peak flow coming in, um, it's gonna prevent that blowout by, you know, settling, you know, an excess amount of water. And then you can just slowly put that water back into the system. Um, so the reduced treatment, you know, but depending on flow and volume, um, it's just going to save you some more money. You can also just settle things out a little better there and get better water quality. So now um, getting back into selecting the right treatment system. Um, so we have some analytical data. We know different sampling points on site. Um, now we can try to figure out, you know, is a uh, Let's just say a metal is it a dissolved or is it um, you know particular is it like a total? Um, do we have organics or inorganics? Um, once you get all that data, um, you can provide it with an engineer or on-site you know services, and then they can decide. Okay, we want to put detention basins in, no, or we want to put an actual engineered um, solution in, or we want to add you know coagulants um, to try to settle things out. Um, so really, it is really important that you get that background sampling data. And then, as I was just mentioning, um, sedimentation settling, 
you know, it's very common, uh, provides a good degree of equalization for your materials that are flowing off site. Um, a good thing about sedimentation basins, um, if you have any local stormwater retention codes, um, I know we've done a lot of projects up in Michigan now where you do have to slowly settle items out. Um, this is a good thing to try and do it that way. And Tyler's gonna talk briefly about a couple engineered solutions. Thank you. Thanks, Trent. So it's interesting, the timing of things sometimes, just looking at my inbox this morning, going through, I saw a news brief uh, that talked about how the Biden administration is emphasizing green solutions for improving stormwater quality. And uh, engineered wetlands is one of those approaches that is, is very effective at dealing with some of these uh, hard to treat stormwater discharges. Um, and, and really it's, it's just, it's taking what mother nature already does and improving that uh, using engineering approaches. So, and wetlands work well for a number of reasons. First of all, they, they tend to be just, they, they, they tend to act almost like a, a sedimentation basin, which is a great first step at reducing those peak flows. It provides equalization. Um, it also, it slows the flows down. It gets the solids to, to drop out of suspension. And so those solids can then get bound up by the, the, the vegetation and, and the, the roots so that they tend to not get remobilized during those higher flow events. Um, dissolved pollutants also can be uh, taken up or absorbed through the, the plant growth. You will see a fair amount of nutrients being uh, taken out of the flow some of it's being taken out by the vegetation itself and in the roots, but a lot of it is that the, the stalks and stems and leaves of the, the aquatic vegetation, uh, really it acts almost like an attached growth bioreactor where that bacterial film uh, consumes a lot of nitrogen and a lot of phosphorus and can show very good removal rates, uh, especially considering the, the cost um, you know, relative to more conventional treatment methods. But the, the downside uh, of wetlands, I mean, there are a couple of downsides. Obviously, you have to have available land. And a lot of facilities don't have a lot of spare real estate just, just laying around. A lot of facilities are landlocked. Um, also, there are some concerns with the viability of green approaches in, in colder climates, especially where you see um, you know, plants dying off and the ground freezing. I mean, you're, you don't see a lot of vibrant functioning wetlands in Minnesota in February. But you know, it's interesting, you're seeing more facilities that are starting to think about this, even in colder climates, because of the, the, the fact that uh, you really have a lot of stormwater that you have to deal with or, or, or poor stormwater quality that you have to deal with. In, in February in Minnesota. Um, and so uh, it, it's, it's an area of additional uh, research and, and it shouldn't be just discounted just because you're in a colder climate, but certainly wetlands definitely shine in those areas where you tend to have the, the higher annual mean temperatures. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, you do get into situations where you don't have any space and you do have those very stringent limits uh, there are adaptations of a lot of existing wastewater treatment processes, and this image here is an example of a, a disk filter. Um, you can achieve uh, very low uh, suspended solids levels, and along with the solids, you're knocking out a lot of metals or other things that tend to be bound up in those solids. And one of the advantages is that by de the fact that this is a designed system, you know the particle size distribution on your stormwater coming in, you can select your filters so that you can, can have predictable and controlled discharge quality. Um, and, and a lot of dischargers, uh, they, they really need to have that regulatory certainty. Uh, but the problem is, is that these units can get very expensive. And so you can mitigate some of that expense by providing some equalization upstream of them so that you're just bleeding the water through. Uh, but there are advantages because you can upsize these units or you can put uh, multiple units in parallel where you do have those very, very high peak 
uh, flow rates. And so in general, uh, it seems like the, the growth on the technology side in the stormwater industry, a lot of it is kind of building on some of the building blocks that you've seen for that physical chemical treatment and solid separation from, from the wastewater industry. And so some facilities, they, they literally have no extra space for putting in additional treatments. So think about your, your, your parking lots. Uh, this type of buried unit can be <clears throat> quite common in areas of uh, very high urban development. Uh, these units can be used for stormwater retention. They can be used also as uh, stormwater, in, stormwater infiltration uh, if you install them on top of a porous media. And they, they can function very well, but they are probably going to be more expensive and you're going to uh, have to do some additional work to, um, to, to, to clean them out on a regular basis. Uh, but speaking of money, there are increasing opportunities for funding. You're starting to see more money uh, become available from the EPA, and that's filtering down into state and local funding programs. And, um, and, and so if you can take your, your improvements and get them into a, you know, multi-use projects, multi-benefits, you can open up your funding into two different funding programs. But, you know, be creative. Uh, maybe think about, uh, do you have a brownfield site nearby? Do you have a floodplain? Can you work with your local municipality in like a public-private partnership? And adding those stakeholders will, will, again, it'll open you up to additional funding streams and, and, and additional options. Uh, think about how some of these improvements can also play into some of your ESG targets, get, get multiple levels of benefits from, from what you're, you're already having to do from a regulatory point of view. Uh, and then in, <clears throat> in terms of, uh, you know, a lot of the younger folks listening in, uh, think about stormwater as a career. It's definitely an area for growth. You can approach it from a lot of different angles, um, and it can be a very uh, rewarding uh, career. So I just wanted to say thank you, and I think we're going to move into the, the question side of things. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. So um, first of all, I just want to say, Tyler, Bill, Trent, uh, many, many thanks to you and Stanley Consultants. Fantastic webinar uh, on stormwater and the newest EPA multi-sector permitting. We've been getting some questions throughout. And so maybe if you want to stop doing the sharing the screen and we all come up our, our smiling pictures, that'll, that'll give something uh, for people to take a, a look at. I'm going to go through and just kind of read out the questions. Tyler, I got a couple for you, a couple for Bill, and a couple for Trent. And maybe I'll just I'll just start reading through all, all three sets so you can kind of be thinking about it. So, so Tyler, in terms of, you know, environment, social, governance, we hear Flint, Michigan, we hear Jackson, Mississippi, we think drinking water, you know, we're now thinking East Palestine, hazardous waste spill, right? Can you think about a stormwater example in that ESG space? Um, we're talking about climate change, wetter, overcoming infrastructure, peak, you know, peak rain, um, sensitive receiving bodies. So can when we think about climate change, where in the country do you see this being a bigger deal, uh, maybe than it has been in the past? And then in terms of crystal ball, um, questions were coming in about PFAS, emerging contaminants. So maybe thinking about that. So those sure. are those are kind of ones for you, Tyler. Um Bill, the ones that I saw kind of during your set, so these would be questions that we'll come back, we'll, we'll come back to Tyler and then we'll, we'll come back to Bill. But Bill, um, do you see MSGP, is it part of industrial pretreatment or is it a standalone permit for an industry where runoff goes directly into the environment? If you can speak to that a little bit. I know you talked about the, the permits and the volumetric load and the discharge rate limits you know, is it around quantity of flow or is it just around quality of the water? Um, and how about, you know, aggregating, uh, allowing or recognizing for run on contributions like, you know, the amount of iron if you're in, a, a, you know, a, ge a geology that has iron, if you're, you know, if you've got construction and you're in up gradient from you and it's adding solids. So, and then, and finally, Bill, that idea of cost, right? You talked about level three being the, okay, now the teeth get you. 
you know, what's the litigation cost versus the engineering construction operating cost, right, for a control system? So if you can maybe speak to those a little bit. And then Trent, finally to you, there were some questions. So how about third-party compliance verification with all that sampling, right? Like what fraction of folks use third-party and, and what are your recommendations there? And you gave us some details about sampling, you know, every 30, you know, within 30 minutes and then every 15 for three hours. And, but what are some of your QA, QC rules for how do you exclude outlier data, right? You always get that weird sample or something. So if you can speak to that a little bit, and then thanks for sharing your practical examples on housekeeping. But if you can talk a little bit to how we enforce those, how do we incentivize those? How do we get the right behaviors from the staff? Because it's, it's good to know that we should sweep but how do you actually make sure that people do sweep? So Tyler, we'll circle back to you. So this, this ESG, uh, this idea of climate and infrastructure, the kind of crystal ball with PFAS, if you could speak to those some first. Sure. And, you know, you mentioned like, like Flint, Michigan, that, that's an excellent example of how environmental justice is a concept that's really being pushed by, by EPA and it's, it's something, it's not just a drinking water thing. I mean, certainly Flint is a great example where you have these communities that they don't have the funding for various reasons. They're economically disadvantaged. And so you see <clears throat> that their infrastructure is not being kept up and maintained. And so when you have some sort of a failure in the system, the impacts of that failure become much, much greater. And so, um, it, it really, it is, to a large extent, it is a funding thing, but when you're talking about stormwater, um, it also has to do with the fact that you tend to see uh, disadvantaged communities or low economic uh, areas, they tend to be closer in proximity to industrial facilities, and so you're going to have, just by, by that, that fact alone, you're going to have more of an impact from those stormwater discharges onto those disadvantaged areas. But certainly, uh, you know, communities that their, their stormwater infrastructure is aging, I mean, it, it costs a lot of money. Um, there was a lot of money put into things, you know, back when the Clean Water Act first came out, and uh, a lot of that infrastructure is nearing the end of its useful life. And so, um, it's, it, it, it's very much a, a matter of who has the money and who doesn't. And so a lot of the federal money, especially is being targeted to address some of those, some of those areas. Sure, sure. Um, but that also is one of those things where like the whole concept of ESG comes in because you get additional recognition points, credits, whatever, from including an environmental justice component in your infrastructure projects. Sure. How about that crystal ball, the PFAS? Any thoughts on that one? Yeah. That's a tough and, one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it, it is. And um, so I, I think that in the case of, of like PFAS, a lot of the, uh, the damage is already done because a lot of uh, facilities, especially on the industrial side, airports and things, uh, firefighting foam, yeah. uh, it, it's being carried off in stormwater and it's impacting a much wider area that then you would have just from the foam itself directly. And so what you're seeing is that a lot of that residual uh, PFAS impact in, you know, on, on soil and things, it's remobilizing with stormwater. And I, you know, you're seeing that it's been largely phased out, but that historic impact is gonna continue to have sort of a long-term legacy impact um, until we can get all of these sites uh, addressed and cleaned up. If, if we can ever get them right. So that, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch, isn't it? I saw that question. I thought, yeah. well, I, I can't not ask it, but uh, there's no easy answer on that crystal ball, is there? So, right, right. Bill, Bill um, you know, so the, some of the questions were coming in. These permits, is this industrial pretreatment space? Is this standalone facilities having their own permit for where their runoff, you know, hits the environment directly? So help us understand that a little bit. And then think about these upgrading issues, right? Whether it's construction or other things that are there that you suddenly get stuck with, but it's not necessarily yours, uh, particularly in that idea of the level three, right? And is it easier to deal with litigation or easier to deal with actually doing, you know, the engineering construction? If you can speak to some of those. Yeah, yeah, certainly I could speak to some of that. Well, as far as like um, with the, the standalone permit or um, industrial pretreatment. So these, um, these permits, they're generally like if you have like a 
stormwater permit associated with industrial activity. It's part of the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Program, NPDES. Um, here many people in this, in this meeting are probably um, familiar with that. So I've seen a lot of cases where someone will have a general NPDES stormwater permit that covers their stormwater permit. And then maybe they'll have like a site specific NPDES permit that covers their um, you know, industrial wastewater discharge. So it's not uncommon to see a facility have two different permits, one that solely governs the stormwater and then another one that um, you know, it's related to their wastewater discharge, and then if they're if they're in certain categories, they would trigger different um, effluent limit guidelines. And the reason I'm bringing that up because that could kind of relates to another one of the questions about like quality versus quantity, mm -hmm. and it, it's it's kind of all um, a, a little bit related here. So you, I have seen some cases where. A facility like that, the state will combine both of those into mm -hmm. one permit. So generally, it's it's more favorable to have stormwater regulate to have a stormwater permit as part of the general it, it, to have a, your stormwater covered under a general permit, mm -hmm. as opposed to having stormwater thrown in along with your NPDES like industrial wastewater discharge permit. And I have seen that happen before. And as I know Tyler and Trent can attest to, there's some cases where um, it's kind of commingled a little bit and things can get really messy really quickly. And then that, that kind of goes to the question of, um, I, I saw that question pop up too, whether it's um, quality versus quantity. Are we just talking, you just have a concentration limit to meet or are there mass limits you can meet? Mm -hmm. Well, some effluent limit guidelines associated with your industrial wastewater discharge, um, those limits are mass-based. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have stormwater infiltrating with that and you know getting into the the, the messy combination, like I brought up, that could kind of that could hurt you, but not but not necessarily related to the multi-sector general permit. It can um, your unfairly having that applied towards your um, ELG compliance if it's mass-based. So mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. no, makes sense, makes sense. Okay, and, and then um, as far, and then that also can be um, related to the, the run on. Um, that there's a facility that we're working with on the Mississippi River. I know Tyler has been a little bit more involved in this than I have, but they were having a lot of trouble meeting their total suspended solids limit for stormwater at one of their outfalls. And um, there was like a whole area up gradient of where they are. So they were getting a lot of run on coming onto their site. So what we did is we sampled the run on so we know what's coming onto the site. We know what's going into the river. Um, is it as simple as A minus B, and that's what your contribution is to it, or can you, um, you know, reroute the run on so it's going to like a different outfall, so you're not being, for lack of a better term, penalized for it. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, it's. I, I know you had several different questions, but my answer is kind of like, it's all kind of interrelated okay. to an extent. There's so a lot, of, um, lot of good engineering judgment in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I hope I answered that. No, it was that, great. That no, part of it. Yeah. It's, and then the, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's great. It was great. I, I'm just, I'm just trying to, to move through as people get different ones. One, one of the ones that yeah. was also this idea of the cost of litigation that kind of might relate to the run on and run off, right. In these, in these level three, right. At some point in time, you could, you could maybe design things and construct things. Other times you might lawyer up. So if you, I don't know if you want to speak to that one a little bit. Yeah, I, I could speak to it a little bit without getting into like actual like hard yeah. numbers, but um, yeah, like, like th that example of, of the run on, like let, let's say for the, the, the sake of argument, you're, you're having trouble meeting your total suspended solids, but then you do some sampling of the run on and you know what's going into the river, you do the A minus B and be like, hey, we'll be under that 100 milligrams per liter if we do that. Otherwise, you know, we may have to construct a settling pond and do this and that and get another treatment system. And that's hard to size when it comes to rain, especially with, um, you know, with like 
climate change like what do you size it to you know <laughs> right right and what's, you're, what's going to work in 25 years and, and peak storm and those kind of it, things exactly so. so in a situation like that i think it, it may be worth fighting because it sounds like you could um that could be a pretty simple fix to get you under the the, the 100 now um an, an ex another example I think I brought up during my part of it, I'm working with a facility and they're consistently well above the benchmarks. And, um, you know, the, the, these um, additional implementation measures hasn't hit their state um, general permits yet. When it does, they're going to be in level three pretty quickly. In a situation like that, I don't think, you know, the litigation will really help. It kind of is what it is based on their operations that they don't have run on that they could blame for it they mm -hmm. there's not like a easy you know what what could can be perceived as a magic bullet to get out of it mm -hmm. so um obviously it would be like um site by site but mm -hmm. the the control cost you know it could be it could be in the millions of dollars okay. and it depending on the size of your site and what kind of numbers you're talking about and you may just yeah, it just well, it just, it, it just it helps people. To, yeah. It helps people park in their mind, right? A magnitude. So, thanks, and, Bill. And you could thanks. see yeah. some success uh, on that that whole concept of an exception because you're not violating a water quality standard. So that's that's some space where you can get into some subjective arguments, but but also be careful because the whole waters of the U.S. definition is changing that land, landscape right, as well. Right. But that might yeah. be a, a place where you could uh, use sort of a, a, a lit litigation or negotiation approach. Okay. And you could be kind of uh, maybe a combination of both. Like Tyler, I know there's been some cases where people have like gotten creative, like, oh, well, um, discharging to, if you go that approach, you're discharging to like a, a small ditch that leads to like a larger river. Like, well, pump it to direct, directly to the river, take the ditch yes. out of the equation, and then you could use right. uh, mixing right. zones. Right. right. Yep. That, that, those nope. are kind of. Yeah. yeah, it's good. It's good. It's just good for the audience to hear those ranges of of options that are out there. So, okay, Trent, to put you to put you uh, to give you some opportunity, put you in the hot seat now. So, you know, you talked about some of the sampling, and you saw some questions came up about third party, uh, you know, compliance verification. Um, you know, I threw in that idea of the QAQC. You know, so so and and then this idea of. You know, you've got a housekeeping, right? But how do you actually mm -hmm. incentivize the behavior, right? You I mean you can, all, you know, the broom only works if somebody uses the broom, right? So yeah. if you can speak to those items, that'd be really helpful. Yeah. So um, we test a lot of facility stormwater. Uh, we do a, a wide range, you know, between uh, metal manufacturers, you know, grain processors, um, you know, just your typical industrial facility that really doesn't have a lot of outside activity, but we um, will help out with their testing. Um, I think it's good to have the third party, you know, performing like those tests. Um, I think your routine sampling, you know, that in industrial client can probably do it themselves. Um, definitely if you're doing like a permit renewal or something along those lines, um, I'd want that third party just in case the state, you know, would go, oh, hey, I see you did this yourself and your numbers look, you know, way too good. <laughs> sure, so, sure. you know, then you can come back with us. Um, and then, you know, that QCA or QC, you know, on the samples, um, that random outlier, you know, we, we do have that actually happen sometimes. Um, so what we try to do, um, you're, you're supposed to take a QC sample every 20 samples you take. Um, so we want to make sure, you know, like, is it the lab that, you know, maybe did a method wrong? Um, did something just get collected in the field, you know, wrong? Um, so we try to QC those. And then if you have a, an outlier, um, a lot of times what you can do is go back, look at your sampling, you know, say it's like 10 times what your average has been. Well, then I would want to write up, you know, a little statement, a letter and say, you know, this, this doesn't make sense. You know, X and Y happened, um, try to prove what happened. And then you can most of the time um, just shelf that item um, and then keep your continuous average going. Um, but you'll want to work with, you know, your regional contact, um, you know, your state, uh, whoever you're working with, just to kind of give them a heads up and let them know like, hey, we have this anomaly, but it, it's not normal operations. Right. Um, and then, so I actually go to a couple different facilities and I do um, stormwater inspections for them, their SPCC inspections. Um, so when I go out and talk with those guys uh, doing their rounds and doing stuff like that, um, 
a, a lot of them, you know, they, they go out, they got their clipboard, they're going to do their daily task. Um, but when I go out with them, I'm like, you know, Hey, you know, what's this thing over here? Or, hey, your, your trash cans overflowing, you know? And, the, and a lot of times I go, well, well, that's not my job or, you know, like I'm not going to sweep the floor over here, but then it's like, but you see like, you know, this is going to go here into the drain that the drain is then going to go to your outfall. Well, you know, your outfall goes into the river where you're just talking about, you know, you like to fish and you like to, you know, do all these other things. Like, um, so just trying to relate to them in a way that's like, you know, like, Hey, you know, this isn't just, you know, you at the facility, like you got to help, you know, the facility wide, the community wide. Um, and then some other options, you know, are, are having like your environmental groups or talking to supervisors on shifts saying like, Hey, you know, like, can we do a weekly clean out, a monthly clean out, quarterly clean out? Um, and then just assigning, you know, those tasks as, as a part of their daily rounds or, or making sure they are, you know, like incorporating those aspects. Um, they're not just walking by a pile of, you know, bean holes on the ground. It's, you know, clean them up. It takes five minutes, just get it done. Perfect. Thanks, Trent. I appreciate it. Well, um, Tyler, Bill, Trent, thank you. Thanks to Stanley for sponsoring the webinar. Marissa, we'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thanks so much, everyone, for all your questions. And thank you to Tyler, Bill, and Trent for sharing your knowledge with us today. If anyone would like to reach out directly to them, please feel free. Um, guys, if you want to put your email address in the chat, that would be great so people can grab that and email you. We really enjoyed being with you today, and we have several webinars planned in the near future. So you can go to aaees.org slash events to check them out and register. If you're interesting, interested in sponsoring an upcoming webinar, please reach out to me directly. My email is mwaterman at aaees.org. And just a reminder, if you're not yet an AAES member and you're considering joining the Academy, please email me and we can discuss our membership options. Last but not least, the PDH certificates for this event will be sent out sometime this week. And that's all for today. Thank you so much and have a great day, everyone.